Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Pegg Jr. and I'm waiting at the moment for others to join. So we'll give this a few minutes. And somewhere here, I've got another link. And I think we're ready to start. So um, I'm Ed Pegg Jr. And I'm going to be talking about things related to the Manhattan Project. Uh, you might have heard that there's a, a movie coming out called Oppenheimer today. Uh, in fact, here's, here's part of the trailer for it. Uh, I'm not sure what that structure is there, but I think that's the uh, the soccer ball uh, configuration of, of hexagons and pentagons for a 32 part series, but not totally sure. So I guess we can get into it. Now let me see here. And let me just sign in here. make sure chat's working so anybody who wants to feel free to to post something on chat and i'll be glad to pause at that point so mathematical games was run by martin gardner for scientific american and that was a big influence on my life uh, martin gardner ran the column for for 25 years and since then there's frequently things that uh, relate to work that Martin Gardner has done. So I've, I've uh, started this series to try to go in depth for things related to recreational mathematics. And many times we end up going back to material that Martin Gardner talked about. So one person mentioned several times was uh, Feynman by, by Martin in Martin Gardner's columns. And there's many things in recreational math and interesting physics and cellular automata and other things that relate to Richard Feynman, who was one of the people who, wa who worked on the Manhattan Project. Uh, uh, Richard Feynman was also the advisor to our company's founder, Stephen Wolfram, and they worked together for several years on things like uh, cellular automata. So I'll get to Feynman's objects at the end. We, I think we have more of his demonstrations relating, um, re relating to Feynman on demonstrations than anyone else of people who were on at the Manhattan Project. But there might be more items related to Einstein. So here's a bit more on Richard Feynman. Uh, worked in quantum computing, particle physics, and uh, he was one of the people who talked about the Challenger disaster. Uh, one of the people he talked to was the person who installed the O-rings on the Challenger, who happened to be my office mate for, for two years back when I was in Lockheed Martin. I found that out when the Challenger came up in the news and he nearly passed out at his desk because uh, it was uh, difficult for him. So I'll be using a couple of, of functions. Here's a new function that just got posted to the function repository credit demonstration. So if you know the name of a demonstration, you can just use this and it automatically inserts it into a notebook. So I use that to help build this talk. And without further ado, Chadwick, Rutherford, and Thompson uh, is an interesting trio. Thompson taught Rutherford, and he, he taught Chadwick. And Chadwick d discovered the neutron. Rutherford found the proton. Thompson d developed the electron. They all knew each other. Uh, James Chadwick was the person in charge of the British wing of the Manhattan Project. And he was the only person 
um, other than than Oppenheimer and the lead military people that had access to everything, except for the plutonium. He wasn't given access to that area. So uh, he Chadwick was one of the people who worked on the Manhattan Project. With all these new things being found about atoms, uh, Einstein wrote a letter with help from Enrico Fermi and uh, Al Schlislarg, I'm probably mispronouncing various of these names. Uh, Albert Einstein wrote this letter to Roosevelt saying that it was important to look at what nuclear forces could do because the Nazis were, were investigating it. One of the people that helped write that letter was Eugene Wigner, uh, who was one of the people who figured out how the atomic nucleus and symmetries and everything else work. And the Wigner distribution is one of the things we have a demonstration for. So as we change the quantum number of something, the Wigner distribution changes. And this is uh, uh, one of the functions in our demonstration area. There's also the Wigner quasi-probability distribution, also known as the Wigner 3J symbols. And here's a demonstration done by Stephen Wolfram. And as you change the parameters of the 3J items, you get these different fields. Uh, the Wigner 3J symbols give amplitudes for pairs of quantum spins in different states. So one of the people that wrote, helped write the letter uh, did many things in math and physics, and we just happened to have quite a few demonstrations related to him. Uh, Leo was another who uh, was involved with the creation of the letter. Uh, he was the one who patented the idea of a chain reaction. He helped with the Einstein letter and worked with Enrico Fermi to get a patent for the first nuclear reactor. Uh, he also uh, worked on the electron microscope, linear accelerator, and cyclotron. Uh, and here's, and also the refrigerator. Uh, refrigeration was something that he and uh, Einstein worked together on. And relating to the refrigerator, you have excited states of, of atoms and how you can perhaps cool with them. And Maxwell uh, had this thought experiment called the uh, Maxwell's Demon. And it was uh, Leo Slizlard who managed to solve the problem with help from uh, Leon Brion. Let's see here. So they wrote the letter that uranium would possibly build a bomb with a destructiveness vastly greater than anything now known. Uh, one person who was brought in for that, uh, for the actual report to Roosevelt was Edward Teller. Uh, and he um, did a lot of work with Oppenheimer, and he was one of the people that stayed on the project. Uh, when Oppenheimer left, it was mostly Edward Keller that was, uh, was the one who, who stuck around to try to develop more, uh, such as the hydrogen bomb. Uh, most physicists tried to get away from the project. Uh, he was a little bit of a... Um, of a difficult personality and the person who was sort of his foil in all this who i'll mention more at the end is, is stan ulam whenever edward teller had an idea for something it was uh, stan ulam's job to try to show that what he was wanted to do was impossible and uh with the with those um calculations by stan ulam the united states ended up saving uh, billions of dollars on projects that wouldn't work. 
So um, one of the things Teller worked on was the mechanism for the plutonium bomb. And uh, so as the ignition starts, it basically forces everything towards the center and then a chain reaction starts. And that is the same device that's shown here in the trailer where you've got a, a 32 object uh, structure all aimed at a center point. And those 32 objects, uh, um, this, the soccer ball configuration uh, gives the 32 uh, charges. Let's see anything else I want to mention here? Uh, John von Neumann is one of the people who also worked on this, uh, helped develop the first computers. And here in the University of Illinois, it was uh, von Neumann and Oppenheimer that got the first computer built here at the University of Illinois uh, back in the, well, I'm not sure of the year at this point, but uh, ILLIAC II. Let's see, and here's another that Teller worked on is Posh Teller Potentials. Here's a demonstration by, by Klaus where you can adjust the fields and get the different results of non-relativistic wave equations that come out from uh, Posh Teller Potentials. So these are different items that relate to people that worked on the Manhattan Project. Let's see here. Another is another with posh teller potentials. And this is by uh, Cy Blender. He's the one who put together this demonstration. And he describes them here. Uh, Schrodinger equations for a class of potentials of this form are known as Klaus uh, partial Teller potentials, and they're exactly solvable. And at the end, as Sai mentions, a remarkable property of these as they change. These, uh, these functions have uh, various special properties. And uh, they will eventually be available on the community site. This whole talk will go onto the community site. And all of these are demonstrations that are available in the demonstration project. So another person who brought in, um, in 1941, plutonium was discovered by Glenn Seaborg and his um, his understudy in the day before Pearl Harbor, Ernest Lawrence was brought in to figure out how to separate uh, uranium-235 from uranium-238 electromagnetically. Here's a picture of him. Um, but we were in the midst of a war as soon as it started. So in, in order to build the cyclotron, uh, they couldn't use copper because it was it was um, important for the war effort. So what they did is, is they went to the repository and got uh, 14,000 tons of silver instead, uh, shipped it to a place in New Jersey, uh, and uh, there it was refined into uh, billets, which were then sent to Oak, Oak Hill, Tennessee, and they built what's called the racetrack. Uh, the I, th I think the Y-12 racetrack, and it's basically the largest object ever made with silver in human history. And with that, they separated uh, isotopes for building this big uh, bomb project. And here's a uh, 
demonstration that shows a bit of how the, how about how the cyclotron works, developed by uh, Ernest Lawrence. So this was built in concept, and then they built it in giant scale uh, uh, ten years later using silver. I'm not sure if that will be in the movie, but it'd be cool if they did show the racetrack. So we have uh, Robert Oppenheimer here and Ernest Lawrence. Well, uh, my friend Cy here, he drove this car and he mentions it here. Uh, on a personal note, I spent the summer of 1956 in the T-Dimension in Los, Los Alamos where Oppenheimer once reigned. For a month, I lived in a house with my supervisor, Rolf, while he was away. He was in possession of a beat up 1937 Plymouth that had once belonged to Oppenheimer. And as I drove that car, I drove that car to work for a month. The one Oppie drove to San Francisco to see Gene Tatlock. So uh, possibly in our audience right now is a uh, Cy Blender who drove Oppenheimer's car and it features prominently in the movie. Here's more on Oppenheimer. The father of the atomic bomb, uh, he also wanted to get uh, control of nuclear power a afterwards. Uh, let's see. And one of the things he worked on was uh, limits of gravitation. Uh, the Tolman Oppenheimer Volkoff limit of two solar masses is uh, an important limit for whether a star will collapse or turn into a black hole or a neutron star. Uh, the, I guess the Tendresikar limits, I'm probably botching that name, uh, later added more bounds uh, to, to how these work. So, but uh, here's a demonstration by Cy, who once drove Oppenheimer's car, uh, that's in our demonstration project. And Oppenheimer was one of the people who worked on this. Another Oppenheimer is the Born Oppenheimer approximation. And another demonstration by Psi. As these are changed, the, let's see how he describes this. When a diatomic molecule undergoes a transition, it changes its vibrational and rotational quantum numbers. And he, this is all explained in gory details. And the Born-Oppenheimer approximation is, is one of the things used in these calculations. Let's see. So, another person who worked there is Hans Beth. And he worked on, uh, on astronomy things, um, astrophysics, quantum electronics. But um, one thing he's known for is righty tidy, lefty loosey, which he based on relating the right-hand rule of vector products. That's how he remembered it, how, how um, tightening bolts work. Uh, Hans Beth also applied double groups to physics. The uh, Molen series uses double groups. And he was the one who, who wrote the original articles in 1929 for how to describe these. Um, uh, Klein was the, uh, was the one who uh, first applied them to mathematics. Another item is the Beth and Sats of quantum integrable models. And in 1980, in, in, in 2006, uh, 
this model was expanded um, to make this periodic box ball system. Let's see if I can expand this more. That seems pretty simple. I'm not exactly sure how these work, but um, these uh, develop uh, periodic boundary conditions leading to quotient space, space spaces and rigged configurations. And these came out of study of the Beth and Sats. Uh, Beth lattices, which are useful for uh, calculating the effects of a chain reaction, are also known as uh, k airy trees. So here's a, a sample uh, uh, k airy tree in Mathematica, but they're also called Beth lattices. Another person who's in the movie, uh, Isidore Rabi, uh, played by David Krumholtz, is this person, um, he won the Nobel Prize uh, right when the project was getting started off for nuclear magnetic resonance, which is now used in CAT scans, magnetrons, microwave ovens, microwave radars. Uh, in fact, um, when he got older, he needed to go to the hospital to have something study and he, he was put into a CAT scan and he was quite amazed that this thing he developed was actually being used to save his life. And another thing he worked on was uh, rabbi frequencies. So here's a demonstration polarized polytron fields on the point car sphere, and we can change the rabbi frequency and see how that changes the model. Let's see. And there's various things you can change in the demonstration, such as the rabbi frequency and the polarifron lifetime. Werner Heisenberg of the famous uncertainty principle also developed the Heisenberg real matrix group. And that has what's called a null space that can be defined. And this demonstration uh, shows how you can modify the null space torus based on the Heisenberg real matrix group. Let's see. All right. Uh, Paul Dirac, another person who worked there, worked with um, Schrodinger, and he came up with various tricks to show how these seemingly impossible items might work. One of them was called the, the belt trick where you've got a middle object which can't change, but things need to twist in strange ways. So here we have a, a twist going on. The middle part is, is basically staying unmoving. But uh, as, as things move around the way Dirac uh, described, we get a desired result in terms of uh, spins. And basically he's, he's shown that all these um, weird items can happen on an atom in such a way that the, the spins can change a state without affecting the, 
the central part of of the object. So this uh, belt trick was was developed by uh, by Dirac to show how it was possible for for with uh, uh, the concept of double twist for everything to work out nicely. So you start with a a belt. You want to get it into a different set of uh, spin states. And this belt trick shows how that is possible to do. And it does um, various homotopy work on the Lee group. Much of the stuff I, I do not well understand. But I'm, I'm trying to familiarize myself with all the people that were, are going to be in the movie so I can perhaps enjoy it more. I haven't seen the movie myself, by the way. It, it, only, it only comes out today. So Enrico Fermi was an, is another who worked in the project with uh, Oppenheimer. And here's a whole bunch of names uh, mentioned in one demonstration. The um, quantum mechanical effects can, of a gas can be predicted in various ways. And there's a Fermi-Dirac formulation, a Bose-Einstein uh, formulation, and a Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, formulation. And at uh, high temperatures, they, they all tend to agree. And things get stranger at some point. At this point here, I suppose. But there's good agreement between these three items in terms of quantum mechanical effects. Albert Einstein is another who started the project off. I don't think he actually worked, uh, went to the Manhattan Project um, directly. Uh, probably a good thing because uh, Albert Einstein was very well known, and if he traveled anywhere, the press would have would have uh, gotten wind of it. So, the fact that he kind of stayed in one place and was uh, uh, kind of um, stayed boring uh, helped keep the project secret. And of course, uh, we've got many things related to Einstein and demonstrations including gravitational lensing, where if you, ch you can change the mass of the lens to, sh to show how it, how it works on different fields. These are all predicted effects on uh, different lattices for, for gravitational lensing purposes. We can also look at Einstein solids. And there's a description of how these work here. A simplified model of a solid where each cell is represented by an oscillator. And as you change these, you get different results of uh, energy and occupancy working on Boltzmann distributions. And we get back to Feynman, who um, was kind of the, the popular guy at the Manhattan Project. And one, one thing he worked on later was called the wobbling plate. Uh, so um, as he describes it, I was in the cafeteria and some guy fooling around throws a plate in the air. As the plate went up, I saw it wobble. And it was obvious that when the medallion went around faster than the wobble. So he started figuring out the motion of the rotating plate. And as he did his research, the, the, the difference of angle and the, the velocity and the time 
change the number of turns and wobbles. So he figured out that when the angle was slight, the medallion rotates twice as fast as the wobble, two to one. And it came out to a complicated equation. He, he worked out the equations of the wobbles, and then he recalled uh, electron orbits and relativity and the Dirac equation for electrodynamics, and then brought in quantum electrodynamics. And then from this equation he got from the wobbling plate, uh, he came up with a discovery that won the Nobel Prize. And now the uh, replica of this Cornell plate is at the exhibit for the centennial of the Nobel Prize. So basically he just started to work on a somewhat silly problem. Uh, how does this plate wobble? And he wound up making a major discovery and won the Nobel Prize. That's sort of the, one of the natures of recreational mathematics is sometimes you'll get results that you don't expect. Here's another uh, Feynman object. You've got a circle here. And you've got basically two points. You've got the green point and the blue point. And you basically start drawing the circle and you do the perpendicular bisector of the line segment of the blue point. And you use that to make a, a point on the, on the radius as it's rotating around. So uh, here on the blue, we've got a perpendicular bisector. And we're just basically figuring out the intersection point with the line that's drawing the circle. And Newton showed that if you do this set of steps, you get an ellipse with the center of the circle and the other point that you picked as the foci of an ellipse that's generated. And uh, Feynman used this. Uh, particular construction in his, in his uh, famous lecture here. And uh, Bob Brimmer uh, came up with a demonstration that basically shows exactly what Feynman showed in his talk. Another is a cellular automaton, what's called the uh, Meos. Mazoyer firing squad. Uh, in uh, lectures of computation, he talks about message passing. You can only influence neighbors to either side. And basically from some starting configuration, you want all the characters uh, on the entire line to reach the same color. And Based on the number of soldiers, this is one method that that works. It's and uh, the cellular automaton uh, solution is known as uh, the firing squad. And this this uh, demonstration by Brad Klee is a demonstration of how the cellular automaton works. It's a seven color rule, and for the original problem, it would be. It would take a long time, uh, this many steps, in order to um, uh, reach a particular value. And Stan Ulam uh, also worked on the Manhattan Project, and he did more later. Uh, uh, he also did a lot of initial work with Cellar Automaton and a lot of work on computers. So here's um, one of his cellular automatons. And the way this works is uh, down here. Um, here are the rules. And basically, if the growth touches itself, there's an elimination step. And uh, it grows somewhat oddly. So there's a um, a little bit further back. Uh, 
another item he worked on was the uh, primality bit spiral. So uh, as he describes it, uh, he was at the most boring lecture ever given. So we started doodling and he basically put the numbers in a spiral. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, so on. And he just basically wrote it in a spiral and the lecture didn't stop. So he circled the prime numbers. And he noticed that they, they uh, made this pattern. And he thought that was generally interesting. So we had a computer make a much, much larger grid for what this looked at, looked like. And then he sent the result to Martin Gardner. And Martin Gardner liked it enough that he wrote a column about the ULAM spiral. And so it got nicely popularized. Uh, and it turns out um, when you do enough structure on the primes, you'll get these different uh, patterns that fall out. Uh, one thing that was noticed by Euler with the polynomial, if I remember off the top of my head, x, x squared plus x plus 41 will give a prime number uh, up to x equals 40. Another item uh, Olam worked on was uh, the early experiments with chess on a computer but it was difficult, um, so they tried simplifying it. And it was uh, Cy Blinder, who happened to be the one who worked with Ulam on this pro uh, project. And this um, computer chess was one of the things that Martin Gardner wrote up in math Mathematical Games uh, under the name uh, Los Alamos Chess. So it basically has a smaller board, simpler pieces, uh, castling is still possible. Uh, but there's no in passant. And with this smaller board, they were able to get the uh, 1950s era computers to actually uh, work on chess problems on the Maniac 1 computer. And it's possible that Sai is in the audience with us if he wants to say something in chat. Let's see. So, um, we have all these people that worked on the Manhattan Project. Uh, and I wanted to get uh, familiar with, with these people before I saw the movie. And it turns out that we had uh, many demonstrations and there, there's, uh, there's about a hundred more on the demonstration site relating to, to these people. Uh, so I, th I thought I'd go over them. And that I believe is what I had prepared. Yes, I'll be glad to go over any of this if anybody would like to to see more. And I'll be glad to talk to anyone. Uh, go ahead and uh, post in chat if you have anything. I'll be glad to try to answer any questions. And I believe uh, this is going to start playing tonight. Uh, thank you, Dugan. And you can basically look up any of these people at the demonstration site and you'll see them. And I'll have this uh, posted to community uh, probably within a few hours. Yes, many thanks. I think we do have a few things related to Go, but they don't actually play Go. Um, you, well, you can play a two-player game, but I don't think we have any computer Go uh, demonstrations at this point. Uh, I I believe um, some of the early computers did try to solve uh, Go, but they didn't get very far. But uh, they've gotten much further with playing Go recently.
So I think that is a good place to call it for now. And I thank everyone for attending.